Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This podcast is brought to you by the demons in my head, the angels who told me I should do this podcast, and all the signed and unsigned permission release forms from everyone I mentioned in this podcast. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, and the upcoming book Murder. There's an app for that, all based on my fantastical, crazy life. You can listen to the serial podcast version of Novel 1 and Novel 2 here at The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles and wherever you listen to podcasts. And both the books and the hit podcast, along with this one, How I Killed my mother are a cast along with this one how i killed my mother are available at mafiahairdresser.com and now on with this episode of how i killed my mother this is a twofer the first one's called first loves and the second one's called throw in the towel this one's called first loves When I attended junior high school in my hometown of Glendora, California, I had gawky buck teeth, which had been formed and shaped from thumb sucking past the normal thumb sucking age, which I hope was around 11 or 12. Um, But don't Google that. I don't want to know. And I was skinny and short with a rainforest dense head of reddish brown hair that engulfed my entire freakishly small head on my five and a half foot slight frame school for the most part i was invisible i was unthreatening and unmemorable in middle school yet i was never self-depreciating or insecure you know i was just an adolescent gay boy who's ready to blossom at some time and i was always told by my parents and my grandparents that i was special and loved so i liked myself well enough and i had worked at my dad's gas station and worked on cars since i was like nine which made me used to adults and i was practically brought up by and tutored by um a pitiful handful of adolescent boys teenage boys who worked for my dad Admittedly, my upbringing and self-esteem was a gift and a leg up in life, which helped me walk through the halls of junior high school with my head up, even though I was invisible. And bullies didn't pick on me. Uh, they didn't pick on people. Uh, they didn't pick on people with good self-esteem. So I wasn't hassled in my younger years for being a little on the feminine side. I mean, you hear this voice, right? Of course, at that time, I never told anyone except for my junior high school boyfriend that I was gay anyway. That first boyfriend's name was Kyle. His dad lived in Hawaii and he had a cool mom, Kyle. Had an always tan bod and he was muscular for his age from surfing and skateboarding. And man, he was such a freaking happy person. What a smile he had. Oh, and he had that 70s classic longish saltwater bleach curly hair that girls went wild for. And we were lovers in junior high school from 7th to 9th grade. In our days, our town's high school began in the 10th grade. Towards the end of our last year in junior high school, school, Kyle told me he loved me. By that time, I had already begun forming in my mind who and what I wanted to be before our upcoming year in high school. And it didn't include having a secret boyfriend. So brace-faced me told Kyle that we were too young to be in love and that we were just having sex. So that was harsh, I know. I was cold at that time. That cold statement was one of my deepest regrets in life. Maybe not for breaking up with him, but that statement, like I just said to him, it's just sex. But back then, I thought I was on my way to becoming someone completely different than a boy who I was in junior high school, not invisible. Um, And I didn't think gay was a thing that I was going to embrace. I was never one to be distracted. When it came to sacrificing my relationships, I kind of always went for something else. So it's no wonder that I am perpetually single. 
Anyway, that last year of junior high school, I had my braces on my teeth to pull them back into my face. And then I got them off the very week before I started high school. And that summer before high school, I had also already begun cutting my own hair perfectly. And I had what was called the dry look or feathered hair. And I made sure that every hair was in place to look as close to John Travolta's hair in Saturday Night Fever. I had grown three inches from 5'6 to 5'9. So by the time I walked into my first year of high school, I was an average sized sophomore with a game show host worthy smile, as well as a newly adopted personality inspired by the same movie girl whom I stole my look from. And almost no one recognized me from my old junior high school, and absolutely no one knew me from the other feeder junior high school. This was the first time in my life when I felt I had been reborn into a new me. The new me joined track and cross country, and I got involved in school functions and band, which was not an uncool group to join because half of them were stoners. That first year of high school also inspired me to put myself into the race of what I understood what it was to be popular, and I had to put together a strategy which I believed would elevate me to have the friends and respect I thought I desired to have at the age of 15 going on 16 in my sophomore year. Girlfriends were my strategy for being popular. And I'm sure some women might think that they know where I'm going with this because females understood because females understood that they have always been the ladders to men's success. Traditionally, in business, the top-level hirers always looked for and hired the men who had wives because those men were thought to be the men who would work harder and stay at their jobs longer because they had to support their wives, who would most certainly want kids, which also added to their perceived dependability and worker desirability. Women also helped men dress, refine their social skills, and weeded out their men's friends who brought them down socially. And in most men's circles, by having the prettiest or the most desirable arm candy on your arm was highly regarded. A man with a hottie would be looked at as more desirable to other women and rank socially higher. I could elaborate on the objectification of women or how men use women to get ahead, but arguably women are smarter than men. And if we just do what they told us to do, we would probably get further in our lives. If I were to expound on the subject of men needing and using women to get ahead in life, I would not sugarcoat it or make excuses for us men perpetuating how we use women, Uh, whether it's a social system or that it is the way we men were taught to be with women in the world. I'm not going to say it's right or wrong, but I will say that I didn't make the system when I thought I was so brilliant and original as to think I could get what I wanted by strategically dating girls in high school to be more popular. I was not the original asshole, just one of them. And I didn't walk into my first year of high school with a clique or any close I was able to hang out with. But I did have an innocent looking pimpless boyish face, the great hair, dark almost pupilless eyes, and a job at my dad's gas station, which begot money and freedom, not to mention by the end of my first year in high school, a muscle car. And I hit the ground running that first year by asking a lot of girls on dates. (sighs) Each successive girl I went out with or was associated with was usefully prettier and more popular than the last one I went out with. If the current girl had a popular rating of two on the John David scale of one to 10, I would soon break up with her and start going out with a girl with a popularity rating of three or four and so on. My young boy brain formulated the belief that by acquiring and maintaining a reputation as a ladies man, I would surely be popular. 
And as I rose through my dating girl rating scale, my popularity would rise above invisible and soar myself through mid-level mundanedom to land me on the plateau of the cool kids. When I started out, I dated girls whom other girls might have thought he could do better. And since I was a gentleman and I visibly treated my girlfriends with chivalry and respect on the outside, like opening doors and listening, the other girls with higher ratings would see my desirability, my sweet man, boy, sexy chivalry, and want to take that current girlfriend's place. I knew I could harness and use the teenage girl's natural backstabbing and competitive traits to help me achieve my mighty ascension. Young boys who dated girls were assumed to want to have sex with girls, but most girls in school didn't usually set out to go out with guys to actually have sex with them, even though they did want to date a ladies' man whom they thought would want to have sex with them. During my entire dating career in high school, I had banked on the fact that while teenage girls experienced the hormone surge, like us boys, they were much more cautious and calculating about their reputations and were afraid to do it. So I never anticipated that I would actually have to go all the way with the girlfriends. But I certainly made sure most of my peers in high school would have most assuredly thought I had because I never did kiss and tell. And I began building and maintaining my ladies man reputation by dating girls who also wanted to date me. My high school reputation, by the way, was fine. Just fine. How fine. How I did it or how I didn't do it was that on my dates, I would park my muscle car, my root beer, brown, orange, pinstripe, 1968 Plymouth Barracuda somewhere on Glendora Mountain Road, our town's makeout area. Once parked, I'd put the back seat flat and open the trunk divider. So me and my date would then start the kissing phase, which I didn't mind. Then I would begin to breathe harder on purpose while rubbing myself against her and touching her breast assist. All of the second phase stuff was to mimic testing as in to make her think I was seeing how far I could get with her. Most of the girls would push my hands away. Yay. All of this second phase stuff was to mimic testing, as in to make her think I was seeing how far I could get with her. Most, most of the girls would push my hands away. It was then I'd initiate phase three, which included a few pants, you know, <laughs> more like, I guess, grunts, followed by a lot of added tongue action, not only in the mouth, but a few licks and nips around the ears and the neck. And I thought my mouth actions, my barbarian snorts and shouting botting language and aggressive groping added to the illusion of my faux adolescent boy passion, which was similar to what courting Rottweilers might do. If for some reason the girl started to enjoy this as much as I didn't, I would proceed to phase four. Full on nipple pinching and earlobe biting, which most every time led to me being pushed away and sexually rejected by my date for moving too fast. My date would most certainly and welcomely tell me to kill my jets. It happened, it happened rarely, but if any of my calculatedly overly amorous advances led to submission or reciprocation of any kind, I would move to DEFCON 3, which by definition means to increase force readiness above required normal readiness. In DEFCON 3, I'd have to start right in on the pawing of her thighs towards her lady lower parts area. 99% of the time, this gropey last ditch action would always bring a swift end to the sexual segment of my dates. After a slap to my face, I would immediately feign disappointment uh, with respect. Uh, and then I would suggest we do the next best thing, like hang out at Winchell's Donuts in downtown Glendora, where I would secretly allude to my GMR conquest to my guy friends who were also hanging out there at this to my guy friends who were also hanging out there at the time. 
At the girls section of Winchell's, my date would most assuredly tell her friends what an insatiable sex dog I was. After those dates at GMR, it was always easy to break up with that girl by using the excuse she didn't put out. And then I'd select another one of the backstepping, circling girls to date. One who had a popularity rating higher than the last one. When the both of us entered high school, Kyle and I ran in completely different circles. So it wasn't until early on in our junior year of high school that we foolishly hooked up once more. It was at that time I realized that I was gay and I only wanted to have sex with men. And he realized that us was never going to happen because I was still all about the social climbing. And since Kyle was always and still is a sincere good man who is never phony nor tight for societal bullshit, all of which were part of my core value system controlling my soul during my early high school years, we said our last goodbyes to each other and our physical relationship. As we were getting dressed in his mother's basement, he told me about a girl whom he had met at a different high school that he really liked. Her name was Kathy. And for what it was worth, I gave him my blessing. It turned out that he married Kathy a few years out of high school, and they had a very happy life together, and he loved her very much. After Kyle and I hooked up for the last time, I still continued trying to date girls in high school because I had my sights set on getting to higher levels of popularity, and I didn't want to get my gayness in the way of that. And my not having sex tricks continued to work for me with the exception of a girl named Julie, who was like a a seven. Unfortunately, Julie was one of the few girls not afraid to do what she thought I wanted to do. She was either already primed, not a virgin, or she wanted me to have the honor of being the first boy to place his penis into her vagina to get that experience out of the way. We were both in band. We hardly knew each other, so it was not love. I only realized that Julie wanted to have sex when we parked on GMR and she began to unzip my jeans. I had gone through all of my phases and DEF cons and I began to freak the fuck out. As she began to claw into my pants to get to my parts, I had to quickly think of a way to make that date come to an abrupt end without ruining my hard-earned reputation. Immediately, I halted snorting and pawing at her own pants and parts, and I stopped her from opening my pants. I stopped her from opening my pants. I knew I only had seconds to try and think of an excuse of how to get out of this situation. I had to say something that was not too lame while still retaining my social ranking. Wait, I said clutching her clawing hands on my belt. Um, let's make it special, Julie. I convinced Julie that I liked her so much that I wanted to make the impending event something we would remember the rest of our lives. I got her to agree to postpone to the next night when there was going to be an unsanctioned band kager at one of the drummer's parents' houses. I told her that we should meet up there and we could sneak up to our friend's bedroom for the ultimate romantic special experience. So, unabashedly, I showed up to the Kager, another band member. And when Julie saw me, she was so pissed off that she broke up with me with a shout scolding in front of everyone and, unbeknownst to her, added wood to the fire of my reputation that any young man would give his right testicle for. I jumped from the 7 level to the 8 level. I was going for the 10, baby. And um, thank you, Julie. And so sorry, Julie. Ooh. Yes, I was horrible. And being young didn't excuse my crimes against womanhood. But to my credit, I feel as if I have paid off some of my bad karma by doing the best hair on all of my lady clients over the many decades as a hairdresser. And anyway, I only made it one and a half more levels the rest of my sophomore year and junior year of high school. And then my my best friend Chuck asked me if I would like 
him to suck my dick on my 17th birthday, which was May 28th. And that ended all that dating girls and social climbing. Since Kyle seems to be the best part of this little story, I will just tell you the full circle about our relationship. In the late 90s, I was living and shuttling between Toronto and Chicago. I was engaged to a, a Toronto man, but he broke up with me. So I decided to spend some time back in LA with my parents before moving back to Chicago permanently because that was my then home base, but I have a couple of weeks off before I had to go back to work. While in SoCal with my mom and dad, I looked up Kyle by phone and we made plans for dinner. But within hours of those plans, he almost immediately called back and canceled. He, that his wife, Kathy, knew all about Kyle and me, and she didn't feel comfortable with us meeting. I don't remember if I had been feeling sad or I had some kind of rebound feelings from my recent breakup, or I just wanted Kyle as an ex-boyfriend to make me feel better about myself in some way. In any case, I wished that I had insisted that he and his wife, Kathy, join me for dinner instead of just him or me. I don't know if she would have liked that idea, but I would have liked to have seen him and I would have loved to have met Kathy. In the summer of 2021, I prayed to my dead mother by asking her if she would connect me up with Kyle again. You see, I had previously talked to my mom via a psychic medium, at which time mom told me she was going to bring me together with another ex, one that got away, which she did months later. Uh, in, or this instant, in 2021, my request from my mom was fulfilled in only under a week. Kyle had found my phone number online and called me to reconnect with me. He was feeling down and melancholy. At that time, in the summer of 2021, I had recently made a big move to Florida, and I myself was feeling a bit melancholy, if not overwhelmed. I had lived in Chicago for over 29 years, and the move to Florida felt like a big new chapter in my life, which emotionally led me to review my past, and Kyle was a big part of my past. That's why I asked mom if she would connect me with him. In that phone conversation with Cole, it was apparent that he was also reviewing his past. Neither of us were interested in sparking a romance or anything like that. We were just a big part of each other's growing up. And when one gets older and wiser, you realize people come in. We were just a big part of each other's growing up. And when one gets older and wiser, you realize people come in and out of your life and you're vibing the same and you come back again. So I believe there are no coincidences. Just forces that bring you together with the perfect people at the perfect time and the perfect events when you need them. Anyway, Cole and I were going through similar tough times. It was literally divine manipulation and manifestation that we were meant to connect and catch up. And it was very nice to hear from him. Sadly, part of the conversation was that Kyle told me that his dear wife, Kathy, had died not less than a month prior to our call. She had died of cancer. It was the right time and I was the right person for him to call because we both shared our love for Kathy, albeit in different ways. I loved Kathy because she had brought Cole love and I cared for Cole. And I was also the right person because I was not in his close circle of family or friends so he could just be himself and talk. And I would only be the friendly ear who wouldn't offer any consolation other than understanding. In the next few years, we kept up our friendship through the occasional call or text. I follow him on IG, and he's a very talented singer-performer. And as of this writing, Kyle is currently dating another woman, and he seems happy again, and that makes me happy. And as I said, if you're asking about me, I'm single, still single. I think I have way too much karma to pay off for all of my past men relationships, as well as the atrocities I have inflicted on my lady dates in high school. I think that if I wanted to scale the relationship karma ladder to get 
to a successful, successful, loving 10 relationship, I'd have to climb way too many levels and I'm just too tired for that. This one's called Throw in the Towel. There is one thing some older men have to give up when we get older, and that is glaring at younger men or women in bars and restaurants while thinking, I'd like to tap that, or say out loud, I should ask them if they want to try out my face as a seat warmer. I have never glared at a younger man, and I have never ever said anything like that in my life. But I have had all kinds of thoughts of sexual things I'd like to do to a complete stranger I've randomly spied upon in a bar or other places of socialization. After all, I have an average level of testosterone in my body, I think, I hope. I mean, I can't get any ball directed to older men. So I knew they were more aggressive and vocal where it concerned picking up younger men and women. And now that I'm the older man, I'm always shushing my other older men friends by telling them to please not articulate their flights of fantasies to me or any of our non-bestie friends within an earshot. Please. Unbeknownst to themselves, it's embarrassing when they ogle and when they express what they would like to do to a younger person who is in their midst. I no longer want to talk or hear about my older friend's manly fantasies. I get it. They may or may not still have six-pack abs in their middle age, and they may be modern and use apps. I just want them to keep their thoughts to themselves. I don't want to know their shit anymore. I think that like the old fox that can't reach those grapes, you know, in Aesop's fables, they're jealous of the other foxes who actually can and still can get them on Aesop's fables. They're jealous of the other foxes who actually can and still can get those grapes. And just voicing what they'd like to do to the grapes only unwittingly voices their sad laments about aging. I know what they'd like to do with the grapes if they could get them. We all know they'd get rejected or a mouthful of nothing they could handle at their age. When most young guys hang out with their contemporaries, usually there's beers, then leers, and a few jeers, which is most assuredly followed by some immodest or cavalier top-of-mind articulations of what they'd like to do or what they just imagined about an anonymous other in their midst. When we are young, creepy like that is expected in our little groups. It's like using every cuss word we had learned in every conversation when we were in grade school. But if I'm listening to some guys over there, you know, and they're like dumb juveniles trying out their little piquant dialectology. But when men get older and continue this behavior, it is fucking just creepy. In today's world, it's almost Weinsteinian. And it just makes your friends think you've never grown up. In fact, we fear that you may have illegal porn on your laptop. Older guys' crass or insufferable behaviors have been tolerated for way too long in society. And I know Me Too's happened and things are changing, but women still have become so used to it that it's easier for them to say nothing. And men, for some reason, have learned since ancient times, I guess, not to call out other men. Maybe because we men don't like to embarrass ourselves. I feel embarrassed when I tell another man what he is doing that's creepy. I'd rather just stab him with a knife, like in ancient times. And I think a lot of woke men wished we would have fucking punched our lechery friends in the face when we were still a face slap to anyone. Everyone knows a generous, rich, alcoholic uncle type in the family, or their group of friends anyway, have one of those. And we all pray he passes out before he actually starts to reach for hugs from his nephews or nieces or their friends that come to the weddings. But I don't care how rich, popular, gregarious, or funny those guys are. They repulse us all when they talk about how hot their 14-year-old's math tutor is. I, for one, have stopped gracing my creepy buddies with my presence when they spew their pathetic and gross behavior. I won't punch them, and I probably won't call them out, but I'll just leave. Which leads me to another subject that is on my mind lately regarding old men. <clears throat> the worst thing about old men is our aging bodies and then parading them around like they were still young in the gym. 
When I was younger, I would hate, 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 hate it when those older men constantly reminded me that the expiration. When I was younger, I would hate, 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 hate it when those older men constantly reminded me that the expiration date on my own fit and furry body was only a matter of time and gravity was going to rip me to shreds. Old men freaked me out and freaked other young boys by walking around naked in the men's locker room. You see, what happens to men's bodies when we get older can be visually disgusting. And when I was younger, it freaked me out. When the old geezers proudly paraded around as if they still had muscular legs instead of blue veins wrapped around sticks. And instead of, you know, asses, they have shriveled, deflated potato sacks hanging off their back. And instead of chest, they have downward pointing pizza slices Old guys always have tumbleweed-sized pubic hair, which completely took over and camouflaged their whole phallus, and yet they never covered their stretched, oversized, falling testicles. I've seen smart, untowled men run smack dab into tiled walls because they were trying not to see what should not be seen. Trying to look up high enough to avoid seeing the aging whores that taunted us all while dashing to the showers. I wanted to wear sunglasses in some of the gym locker rooms I was in, but that would have been equally creepy, but at least not cruel. And I used to wonder what that pouchy blobness above the old dude's pubic line was all about. Was that a hernia or was that another set of testicles that stayed up there and then dropped until a certain age? If I thought that one of those poochy patchy pocket blobs developed above my penis... I think I would have it sucked out, you know, a blob section, if you will. And alas, now that I am older, I now know what that pouchy blobness was. And I haven't had mine sucked out yet. But at least I'll wear a towel around until I have that procedure done and forever on, I will towel up because I'm a nice old man. Another thing that bothers me in the gym are the fat cat stockbroker types who lay down five towels in a steam room so no part of their flabby ass skin grazes a tile, and yet they just never lay a single stretch of cotton across their own privates. It doesn't matter if you travel and go to a gym in a new city or a resort spa or you go to your own local gym. You'll always see that guy. These are the same assholes that invariably leave those five towels in the steam room for the locker room attendant to pick them up. Or maybe I'm supposed to move them aside so I can sit down, which I won't do. I'll just leave. Anyway, that drives me crazy. Look, I get it. I'm a guy and starting around naked was my divine right when I was in my prime. But now I know that the need to walk around without any clothes, you know, was a genetic gender ingrained, you know, was a genetic gender ingrained gag to make all of us other men in the room subconsciously get the message that you're tough or you're in your prime and you do not mess with you or anyone else. But at some point, one has to stop taunting younger men with your naked bodies and showing them that their impending morbidity and mortality is gross. You just need to cover it up. Knowing that this vessel of knowledge and wisdom, muscles and athletic prowess and sexual appeal is one day going to break down is just a wicked, despicable joke. Old dudes, just wrap a towel around it, all of it. Leave all that young men ensconce and bar bravado to the young men who need to feel confident enough to age to be old men. I've seen smart, young, toweled men run smack dab into tiled walls because they were trying not to see what should not be seen. Let's just keep our privates and our private thoughts to ourselves, throw in the towel, and put a towel around it. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or more episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to MafiaHairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.